Welcome to VNTV, I'm Alex Zanowin. As the midterm election winds around, San Diegans will be asked to choose a new county supervisor. The battle for District 4 is a hot one. The seat is currently being held by Ron Roberts, who is retiring. Hoping to replace him is former District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis and former Assemblyman Nathan Fletchers. Joining us today is Bonnie Dumanis. Welcome to the show. Thank you, it's great uh, to be here. All right, now can you tell us why you're running for the seat? I'm running for the seat because uh, I was the district attorney for almost 15 years. I saw a lot of things happening with people that are mentally ill, who have substance abuse problems, and who are homeless. Those are the people that are uh, people we can help at the county level before they get into the criminal justice system. And I'm uniquely qualified because I was a deputy DA, a judge, and a uh, district attorney. Okay. And many people don't know exactly what the county supervisor does, so can you briefly tell us what the role entails? Sure. The uh, public safety is one of the bu big areas that the county entails, so whether or not they fund them properly is one of the things uh, that we're concerned with. And as the former district attorney, uh, together with our law enforcement partners, crime is at, uh, is at a low more than 47 years ago. So wow. we are really at a low in terms of crime. Also is the health and human services. Again, something we deal with in law enforcement. We take care of the poor, the old, the young, the incarcerated, and public safety. So in other words, if you have um, young kids that are sick or need help, uh, CalFresh, those kinds of programs uh, that we deal with for the kids or child abuse, so Child Protective Services. Also for the elders, we have programs for the elders like food and places to go to, but also elder abuse uh, for uh, those that are uh, in the incarcerated. We need to help them as well in getting them the tools to get out of custody so they don't, so they uh, turn their lives around. So basically the county takes care of them from the cradle to the grave, so to speak. That's right, All they right. do. And uh, now, as you know, you were a former district attorney, so why did you step down from that role? Well, uh, I, as I uh, realized that I had done the things I could do, I was one of the most innovative DAs in the country and in the state by creating innovative programs to keep, get people who are in jail, out of jail, and give them the tools to turn their lives around. We became a model in a lot of ways. But what I looked at was how all the people that we helped put their lives back together again after they had been victims of crime, the vulnerable, the homeless who are either victims of crime or commit crimes, as well as the children and the elders, you know, all of those that are really vulnerable, the homeless uh, and the mentally ill particularly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but one of the things that uh, really turned me around was that I had uh, breast cancer. Oh. And that put me into a place where I looked at what I was doing in my life. And everything is okay, I had it taken care of, mm -hmm. um, but I decided I wanna help people before they go into the system. And uh, we are in a crisis situation right now with the homeless, the mentally ill, and substance mm -hmm. abuse, and housing. Nobody can afford housing here in San Diego right now. So that's how I want to spend the next four years is rolling up my sleeves, getting it done, and uh, I'm not even going to take a salary. Okay. Now, speaking of housing, um, I, you, as you said, we are in a housing crisis. So what are some of the ways that you're proposing to solve that crisis? Well, first of all, we need to build because we don't have enough houses for the people that we have here in San Diego. We haven't, because of the recession, we stopped building, and so we have a homeless situation because we don't have enough houses, but we also have um, a crisis with people that are you know, just starting out in life, mm -hmm. who are either police officers, social workers, clerks, you know, those kinds of people. So here's what um, I propose. First, for the affordable housing, mm -hmm. we um, give 100 million, I'm sorry, 100 million dollars a year as a loan for four years to the building industry that works with affordable housing. The reason why they need it, not just to one person, to those that can apply for it. The reason why they need it 
is because in order to get the other funding that often they can get from the federal government, the state government, private industry, they need a local match. So they can take what they need uh, after they apply for it from the county and then they are able to get the other uh, grant from the state and federal government. Then with that hundred th million a year, that's mm -hmm. about 4,000 houses that wow. they can build. So that's one aspect of it. And that's 4,000 single family home or is it 4,000 units? 4,000 units. It could be rentals, it could be houses. There are a lot of different ways uh, to deal with it. The other thing though that's really important is it costs too much money in the process of building a house. So in other words, all the regulations and the bureaucracy costs about 40% when you add that 40% on, a builder has to add it on, the consumer, you and I, pay for that. Okay. So that makes the house 40% more than it has to be. And another issue with, uh, with you know, building um, in construction is that there's a lot of pushback from the communities in certain areas that say, no, we don't want you know, high density housing here or we don't want to develop this area. This is uh, an area that we like to keep as you know, wildlife or like just keep it open range. How do you propose to solve that? Well, I think we do need to respect open spaces and be uh, environmentally protective. Uh, but we have to work with the community to say we need more houses. Going up, you know, in the urban core is a good idea because there are, uh, they can, people can walk. I live downtown mm -hmm. and we can walk everywhere. We have stores, you know, that sort of thing. So. That, that's a really good uh, thing. And we have, you know, the trolley down there, buses down there, uh, ways to get around. But everybody, it's got to be a regional approach, and everybody's got to do their part. But when we go out to the rural areas, we have to look at the rural areas, look at the infrastructure, the traffic, all those things that are going to impact that community, and work with that community so we have housing uh, that we can, you know, put in areas. Uh, that the community can get behind as well. Okay. And of course, speaking of rural areas, uh, one of the concerns about people in the rural areas is that they don't want more housing because it is in a very high fire danger zone. And as you know, San Diego County um, lately has been plagued yeah. by a lot of devastating fires. So is there a middle ground where you can see that we can continue to build but still not put people in like high fire danger zones? Well I think we have to do that and so we work with the fire department, we work with the community and with each other to make sure that we keep the areas around the homes uh, in a way that they are safer from uh, those fires and everybody's got to take a piece of the action and the fire department can help with that as well. So we have to be careful of all these areas. It's not going to be easy, <laughs> but everybody's got to take part. Otherwise, we're not going to have people here in San Diego. I already have, when I was the DA, we had employees that had to come from uh, Temecula, Murrieta, way down south, two hours to get downtown to their job because they couldn't afford a house or an apartment here in San Diego. They had to go far away. That's not acceptable. So speaking of affordabilities, uh, you know, while we're building more houses, what about the rental conditions here in San Diego? Are you for or against uh, rental subsidies or uh, uh, we say rent control? Well, we have rent rental subsidies through HUD, mm -hmm. and we now have that, and I support that. That's what the affordable housing works with as well. So I think those that need it um, need to have that, but we're way behind in how much HUD money we have. I am not in favor of rent control, and the reason why I'm not in favor of rent control is because it hasn't proven to work economically. You will have people fleeing San Diego who own property if they can't uh, you know, raise money off of that property. But I think, you know, working together, nobody wants people to um, have their rent increase so much that it's just way out of reach. So I think we are at a perfect storm. The builders, um, I'm supported by the building industry, and I've been meeting with the affordable housing industry and the homeless industry, uh, not industry, but homeless folks. Yeah. And we will all want to work together now because we need to make these changes now. And I think 
if we brought everybody together. And you know, there's a lot of land that each municipality has mm -hmm. that's either vacant or not being used right now. So if every municipality, there are 18 municipalities and the county in the unincorporated area that have property that's ready to build on, okay. that won't be a problem. Now, you touched on homelessness. It's been an issue primarily for the city of San Diego and some other city as well, but I mean, how does the county work with the city to solve that issue while everything else is going on? Well, the county needs to step up more because they haven't been as involved in housing and the homeless as I think they should be. Um, but it's not just the city of San Diego. There's big pockets in Oceanside and Vista. Um, when I've been walking precincts, Mission Hills, they told me there were a lot of homeless. So we, how we work together is some of that property that I was talking about that are um, vacant municipal properties. We work on that. Right now, we have the tents that are temporary. Mm -hmm. I believe in housing first, the, the evidence-based way to get people who are homeless into houses, but it's not just housing first, it's gotta be housing first plus because not one size fits all. So now, now because we don't have housing, we, we have the tents, we have St. Vincent de Paul, Father Joe is supporting me, Bob McElroy from Alpha Project. We use those temporary ones, we get them services, and we build so we get them into housing eventually. And, uh, you know, the homeless crisis, which, pre uh, which uh, led, to, led to the hepatitis A crisis, which the county has been criticized in their responses uh, to the crisis. Now, when you're, if you're elected as a supervisor, is there any changes you want to make so that should a health crisis like that come up in the future, we will be better res equipped to uh, respond to that? Well, I think we all, the city, the county, and the community, have to be more alert to what's going on. I'm, I mean, this didn't just come about in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a problem that's been going on. And unfortunately, the hepatitis A crisis, we had 20 deaths. That got everybody, though, off their you-know-what to get <laughs> moving on the homeless issue. Mm -hmm. Now we have to take it from there. Ever since I've been in San Diego, there's been a homeless issue. But we can start now and get it done and not wait. We've got enough reports, we've done enough looking at, studying, and we have the homeless uh, task force that's a regional body yeah. with a continuum of care that is working on this issue. We have to put everything we have to this so that this crisis, and the county just declared it a homeless crisis uh, and a housing crisis, we have to make sure that we can get houses built fast so that we can get people moving into those houses. There are those in the chronic area mm -hmm. that have mental health issues that will always probably need to have, you know, like um, somebody coming out to give them services, to give them medication, that sort of thing. That's the chronic. The situational though, that's like the people that are living paycheck to paycheck that can't get into a rental because they can't get first and last month's rent or the rents are too high. You can give landlord um, incentives to get them into that. You can do density bonus. There's a lot of innovative ways to deal with it. Uh, and because of my experience dealing with programs already that have gotten people into housing um, in a transitional phase to do that, I think I'm uniquely qualified. Okay. And you know, let's talk about uh, specifically with the mental health issues, especially for homeless. The criminal justice system has always been used as a crutch to deal with the mentally ill. So, you know, they put them in prisons instead of um, treatment centers. And as a DA, that's kind of like somewhere where you, your experience in their counts. So how do you break that cycle where people are being taken into jail instead of into mental institutions or, you know, or reach out to them before they commit crimes that let them to be in jail? That's my biggest passion is that mental health. The jail shouldn't be the biggest provider of mental health services. So I've proposed a um, urgent care mental health facility in each area that have high propensity for calls for mentally ill. When the police find somebody they're having an episode, or if the family does, they bring them to this facility. You can only keep them there for 24 hours the police go back to doing what the police should be doing, that is keeping us safe and, and watching the streets, 
and the mental health provider decides what's next for that individual. If that individual needs to be locked up for 72 hours while they are examined and find you know, what the next step is, then that's what needs to happen. But oftentimes that urgent health care can find places in the community that aren't locked to get treatment or a family member to get treatment. Or by the time the 24 hours are up, that person may have gotten through that episode and doesn't need it. You're right, people now look at it from the terms of if they don't know what to do with it, they put them into uh, prison. But I went to Florida and I went to LA to study some programs. We also have to train police on how to deal with mentally ill, how to diagnose them basically, how to de-escalate, you know, how to work with them uh, so that they can um, stop that cycle of officers getting hurt and people getting hurt. Uh, as the DA, I found that 80% of the people that got injured or killed in an officer-involved shooting was either mentally ill or under the influence of drugs. So if we take care of those two problems like they did in Florida, the numbers of shootings or um, you know, deaths or officers that are uh, hurt themselves went down to two a month instead of 15 a month. Yeah. And it was really effective. So that's one of the areas. But we have to attack the whole system, uh, I think, in order to get it done. We closed our medical facilities, uh, you know, the state, uh, a long time ago, and it was brought down to the, s to the county area. And now the county's got to really grab hold of it and do something in a systematic way. Okay. Now let's get let's talk about District Four, which you're running for, and that district is heavily Asian. A lot of Vietnamese, uh, Lao, Chinese live in that district. What do you propose to serve that? How do you propose to serve that community? Well, I've been in this community. I've lived in District Four for 40 years, mm -hmm. and as you know, I've been in the community myself, going around to the Asian community, to all the communities, and spending time. So one of the things that I did in the DA's office I want to do in the county is to make sure we have diversity in the county, just like we had the DA's office, that mirror the population at large. So making sure we have a, a high presence of Asians in the county government mm -hmm. at all levels, not, not just the lower levels, but the higher levels. Um, the housing and business opportunities, we have to make sure that this community has those as well and has places to live as well. Uh, and one of the ways I deal with uh, what to give a community or how to deal with a community is to meet with the community and to bring advisory groups together to say, what can we do to help you? And what do you need in terms of support from the county or from me? Uh, Ron Roberts was very active in yes. the Asian community. I intend to follow his lead in that area and uh, we have such a big population here in San Diego. I think it's wonderful. I think, you know, diversity and embracing diversity is a wonderful thing. We're in America. Everybody should be welcome. Yeah, and, you know, like we're right now filming the Convoy District, which has a lot of diverse food, and I think that's part of the charm of having a diverse community is just the food itself. Yes, yeah. but, you know, I live in Little Italy. I want to get some of that charm from the uh, Asian foods down in Little Italy. We don't have much, you know, in other areas as well, and it really is uh, the charm of the community is uh, part of the culture, the food. Uh, it's wonderful. And you talk about diversity in county government. Um, is, will that be also reflected in your staff if you get elected? Absolutely. That is one of the things I will look at in the staff because the staff is going to go out into the communities. And I'd like to have staff that keep that, you know, speak the language, that look like the people that are, you know, serving them. I think that's very important. Okay. And, you know, let's talk about your opponent, Nathan Fletcher. Uh, you guys... I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you've had a contentious relationship with him and, you, you know, running for mayor and now running for uh, District 4. And one of the criticism he has for you is that you are uh, pretty much the same as the current board of uh, supervisors. So how do you respond to that? And what positions do you hold that is currently different from the current board? Well, first, I've been fighting the status quo my entire life. I'm the first woman DA 
in over 100 and I think 50 years and the first uh, uh, gay DA in the nation. So I come from a background of, first of all, a working class family, so I know what it's like. My dad had to work two jobs. He was a truck driver and a teamster in order to, you know, with my mother working as well, to put food on the table. I know what it's like to have to, you know, fight hard to get what you need to do. I put myself through college and through law school and put myself through the ranks uh, to get to where I'm at today. So I'm the American dream. I've never been on the Board of Supervisors, but I have certainly worked with them and they trust me. I think the difference is that I have the trust of the community, the Board of Supervisors, and I don't think he does. And he's never been in the county. I've worked in the county. That's the value of what I bring to the county. But I certainly have a history of innovative programs that have been accomplished. If you put my experience next to his, four years in the assembly, 35 years as a DA, as a deputy DA, a judge, and then the DA, I think there's no comparison. Okay. And you know, we, we're short on time, so one last question. Uh, when you were a DA, uh, there, you know, the backlog for testing rape kits started then, and then your success, successor, uh, Summer Stephan, inherited that. Now, as, uh, if you're elected as a uh, county supervisor, what can you do to you know, solve that issue and so that we don't have a backlog of these cases anymore? Well, they're already working on that because um, you know, Summer Stefan, who is now the DA, uh, has taken money out of her budget in order to start testing them. But there's a, there are a lot of reasons. Some of the policies that the labs had and the police departments had were you know looking at cases in one way so it ended up that they didn't get to the other cases but now the labs are working together and they're outsourcing to get that done so part of as a county supervisor is to see if there is money that's needed to uh, help get those le tests done but i think in very short order uh, they will be done and that's one reason i i, I think it you should remember, I'm not going to take a salary so that some of my salary can be used to do things like that, to provide services and to do things that um, can't be done without that. All right. Well, we're just about out of time, so any last words? Well, I'd like to be uh, your supervisor uh, because I think I'm the most qualified and I bring innovation and new programs uh, to the County of San Diego and uh, I can hit the ground running and I can get to three. Mm -hmm. It takes three votes on the Board of Supervisors to get anything done. So day one I can hit the ground running and I think we can get a lot of the homelessness issues done in four years. And I intend to do that in the mental health and the affordable housing. Let's get it on. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. And you know what, thank you for joining us at VNTV. And remember, the election is November 6th, and the last day to register to vote is October 22nd.